Thank you, Lynn. That was excellent. That was a really great talk, and Lynn has really asked us to think about volunteerism through a series of very interesting, reflective questions. I think we all sort of agree that we think, you know, we, volunteerism stems from this kind of basic human instinct, this passion from, for altruism, um, but also there are some potential risks and harms to it, and I'd kind of like to explore that a bit further with the panel. Um, perhaps I could start with Jen. Uh, you're an emergency medicine trainee. You've been to South Africa recently as a volunteer. You spent a couple of months there. Now you're back in the UK um, training. And I wondered if you could share some of your reflections of, um, and your thoughts about what you thought might be potential risks and harms by your presence as a volunteer there. Um, thank you, Swetha. So, yeah, I spent three months earlier this year um, in South Africa. Um, like many trainees, I'm interested in global health and wanted to find a way I could develop that more. I went to a hospital that's located in a relatively notorious township that's long been a popular choice for um, doctors from Europe and also the US to go and volunteer, um, often hoping to gain more trauma experience. And I think the local doctors who work in that hospital had had really mixed experiences with these international volunteers. Um, and they had a lot of horror stories to tell about people who turned up without doing any research, completely unprepared for what the environment would be like. Um, people who are only interested in trauma would turn up to a shift busy with sick medical patients and say, oh, there's nothing going on, I'll go home uh, and come back later. Or suddenly deciding they can do procedures that they wouldn't do back home, that they know better than the local doctors. Or really just the idea that, oh, I've come as a volunteer, I'm working unpaid, so you know I can kind of do what I like because the hospital should be happy to have me. Um, and it wasn't all negative. There were some positive stories as well. But I think it really made me question, one, what was I doing there? Am I being honest with myself and with other people about the reasons I'm here? And reframe my goal from how can I help here to how can I be least annoying? How can I, you know, how, what, in what ways could I potentially screw this up? And how can I try and mitigate against that? That's really interesting and very insightful. And I think it's quite important to think about these questions before one goes out as a volunteer. Najib, if I could sort of bring you into this as a, as a trustee of an organization that actually deploys volunteers, I wondered how you uh, dealt with this and how you prepared your volunteers before they went out. Thanks, Retta. So yeah, my name is Najib. I'm an emergency medicine consultant based in Leeds. I'm also a trustee of a small medical charity called Doctors Worldwide. And this is, I think, what you've been referring to. We had in the past deployed volunteers uh, on medical missions for humanitarian trips or development programs. And I think the biggest deployment we had was in Pakistan after the earthquake, where lots of diaspora physicians from the UK were traveling out to Pakistan to the zones anyway. And we felt as an organization, if we could coordinate and facilitate that response, that might be better than having an unregulated response. We found it extremely challenging deploying 60 doctors over the space of about three months and trying to look at their standards and the skills and and monitoring and evaluating the impact that they had on the ground. And we were only doing kind of primary health care related interventions. There was no kind of hospital-based surgical interventions. The reaction of that trip was that following on from that deployment, we set up a mandatory pre-deployment course where we expected all volunteers to try and attend. And we got to know them. They got to understand what our value set was. And I think that was really important, that there was a common understanding of values from organization and those people that were going out and recognizing the role of partnerships on the ground as well. We then, in fact, really struggled to send volunteers to the point that we stopped sending volunteers for a number of years because we just found it too hard to monitor, regulate, and also the whole ethics around the sustainability issues of how can you really deploy people for two weeks alone without having a framework and a structure continuing to improve a setup. And most recently, we've started again where we've got our act together a bit more about having programs where volunteers have got very clearly defined roles uh, and expectations that they have to deliver. So it's not so much about what the volunteer is going to do uh, in terms of what they think. It's about managing expectations from a range of stakeholders. So I think those are some of the key things in terms of some training and preparation, expectation management and making sure that local communities and your uh, local partners are also signed up to what those plans are. Well, I think one of the other things that we wanted to explore or discuss in this panel, uh, I think moving on from what Najib and Jen's experience has been, about whether all volunteering has to be on site 
is there stuff that we can do off-site? And do those contribute important elements to creating a sustainable capacity building initiative? So I think that's a brilliant point. I think a lot of us think about volunteerism as only having to be abroad and making a difference. But there's a lot of work that can be done within our own setups that can have an impact globally or can in, in fact increase our understanding of global health context within our own countries, whether it be dealing with migrant populations or, uh, or refugees, etc. A recent example that we've got uh, from Doctors Worldwide is we're doing a, a medical education project in Bangladesh to serve the Rohingya communities um, in Copsas Bazar. And we've created teams of volunteer doctors here who are writing and developing content, which will then be taught overseas in partnership with local faculty. So people feel invested in the process, that they're contributing to a humanitarian endeavor, and they're doing this voluntarily. But at the same time, they don't necessarily have to deploy and they feel they're adding some value with their skills and provided it's mentored and supported and supervised with the context it, so far it seems to be working quite well for us sure. and just to add to that from my own experience with uh, capacity building initiatives I think central to the cause of uh, creating capacity locally is training and a lot of the um, structure to build a, a sustainable high quality good training initiative and therefore create some autonomy within these systems it requires a lot of work that, that needs to be done off-site. I mean, yes, there is the face-to-face -face education training initiatives, but there are a lot of systems that need to be put into place prior to a, somebody going out and doing a sort of training mission, as it were, even. Um, and, and I think there are lots of programs that are realizing that. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity, especially in the, in the way we're developing technology, um, to support a lot of capacity building in, uh, initiatives in country and then creating autonomy and building um, you know, building expertise locally in country. I think I'd like to reflect a little bit on what uh, Jen said earlier about the perceptions of local staff on what previous volunteers have done as well. Um, it's sometimes interesting how harmful those perceptions can be from both sides. And you then have to deal with a legacy of bad blood of what previous volunteers have done, where they've changed processes or have not understood the local context. So I think Again, the whole issue of cultural competence and trying to be humble enough to recognize that during your first deployment, you are there pretty much as an observer to try and learn and understand why people do things the way they do them uh, and the barriers to that. And that can slowly start activating a change. I remember a context from, I, I spent one year in Rwanda as part of a, an international program. I remember nine months into my posting there, um, a patient with epilepsy got brought into our resuscitation room. Now, we've been working with our teams for nine months on how to receive someone critically ill to the resus room. We'd invested time in relationship building in trying to challenge each other as to what were the barriers to delivering effective care, whether it was fatigue, lack of income, lack of equipment, lack of process, etc. And we, we thought we'd almost cracked that, and we'd invested in our Rwandese colleagues as well in developing uh, kind of... Uh, acute medical care teams to respond to someone acutely ill. I remember this patient got brought in. We had already four patients in the resus room. And at that time, um, one of the nurses left the room. One of the doctors went onto Facebook. Another nurse turned and looked after a patient that had already been there for a few days. And no one actually looked after the patient who was convulsing. I remember after that having a chat with the nursing staff. So what happened? Because we've been working on this for nine months. And we thought we'd addressed all these issues. What was interesting, the only reflection point was that they apologized this time around, whereas before they said, actually, we had our rationale of why things weren't working before. But now on reflection, we don't quite know why we responded this way. And it really allowed them to kind of come together and then think about a new solution of what really were the barriers and the cultural issues to activating change. So the lesson for me was that my expectations of suddenly thinking I could go out there and make a difference within a week or two weeks or one month or two months was completely different because nine months down the line we were still working at the system and looking at trying to you know have colleagues that were on the same page and the same language of improving survival rates for critical illness great i think we're going to end this panel on that note um because there's a lot more interesting discussions that are kind of come through through the next panel so if i can invite the next panel um and amy to take on uh, the next talk